Thank, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, good afternoon or good morning. Good evening. Thanks for joining us here. My name is Brian Lambert, and I am a uh, sales enablement consultant and uh, architect in the uh, Performance Readiness Solutions Group here at GP Strategies. And I find uh, a lot of my clients uh, that I work with are going through changes in the learning function. So this content here is in re response to how uh, many of our clients are trying to evolve to add more value to the business. And so I uh, thought it would be a good time to take a step back collectively uh, for those that have joined us on the phone and uh, just uh, really, really think deeply about the learning function and how it's changing uh, to do more with less. So we're going to walk through a, a lot of content here. Uh, feel free to chat some questions in, and we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, I think it's important to come at this uh, from a tops-down perspective. We're, we're all in the learning function in, in some uh, you know, capacity, and I know that we recognize that the world of work has dramatically changed. And, and, and when you look at the type of work, I think we all understand that, that we've moved from a kind of an industrial age to an information age. And certainly there's a lot of topics and a lot of uh, work ongoing uh, in the learning space to, in areas such as social learning, uh, you know, using uh, different technologies, et cetera. So I think we know there's a trend in learning around the information age. But when you think about it from the performer point of view and how working differently uh, has, has evolved or just work itself has evolved, it's important, I think, to, to recognize that for, for most organizations, uh, they've shifted to a more cross-functional view of work. Uh, so in the Frederick Taylor days, the, the industrial age, uh, work was broken down into silos and into different functions. In today's world, in this information age, um, teams are having to, to be developed and people have to work across their silos to add more uh, value to the business. And that's an important distinction because uh, the role of learning is fundamentally different in these two views. And in, in fact, you know, when you think about it, the impact of, of what it means to add value to your CEO and how you impact your CEO of your company, uh, that's evolved too. Because uh, many of today's challenges from a CEO's perspective are being driven by these cross-functional uh, endeavors. And when you take a look at that, uh, I thought it'd be helpful to share some, some research from Forrester Research one of the, the, the jobs that I've held in my past life was as an analyst, and we, we studied um, at Forrester a lot of the market forces that are at play on CEOs. And here are just some of them. And there are many uh, in industry forces, stakeholder forces, and market forces that really impact how CEOs think. And in our role here, in my, my role that, that at GP Strategies, I find that I primarily work in areas where companies are trying to grow. And if you think about it, according to Forrester, there are really only four ways to, to grow a company. You can adjust your go-to-market strategy, and that means you know, entering into new spaces. You can create new capabilities, such as bringing new products to market, and improve customer relationships, so, you know, ele elevating your um, relationship and building trust with clients so that they uh, really partner with you over time. And then, of course, you can increase efficiency and cut costs. So when you think of uh, this new way of working, Many of our companies, and I would submit to you that most of you, are, are feeling the effects of these four uh, levers at your own company. And uh, this has a trickle-down effect. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is the challenges or the problems that these growth strategies create inside your organization are often cross-functional in nature. Because if you think about improving customer relationships, that not, that's not just the sales team that needs to do that, but it's also product groups or marketing groups that also have to do that uh, to, to work together to improve customer relationships. So in this case, um, working differently is a cross-functional view, and that's how CEOs think. So when you think about that at, at a high level, um, the, the world of work is changing. Inside your company, you've got your own uh, initiatives going on, and many of those initiatives are, are really uh, cross-functional in nature. What we're finding is that there's a trickle-down effect of one, CEOs are changing their business model to act and engage the market differently. That really is driven by and, and, and actually creates a different type of value. And, and the different type of value to your customers is, is things like the ability to, to uh, solve different levels of problems or the ability to 
bring a, 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 a widget uh, to market more quickly. And, and uh, maybe it's another a type of value could be really partnering with a, a series of, of uh, partners to uh, bring a new solution to clients that they hadn't thought of before. So new business models are creating new kinds of value, and that requires people to act differently inside your company. And this is important. And I think um, what we're finding is, in the clients that we're working with, that the idea that uh, roles or individuals have to change their behavior is, is well understood, but the detail or the ability to actually help influence that change in behavior is, is uh, tough. It's tough to wrestle with. And I think that really has had learning leaders take a step back and think about their new, the, the need for a different type of operating model and the different uh, way in which they need to work internally to impact their roles, to add more value to the changing business model. And that's what I wanted to share with you today here on this call is how are learning leaders really wrestling with this, this change? Uh, and also, how are they overcoming the barriers that exist as they look to uh, shift how they work inside their company? And now, why is this important? Um, if you think of, of uh, human capital as an asset, which most executives do, um, you know, the, in the United States alone, uh, just, just in, as one data point, the return on assets, which is a, an indicator uh, that Deloitte puts out a, around how uh, assets are, are driving value inside the company, that return on assets has fallen 75%. Now, the imp implication of this is productivity is, is, is hampered because you're not being able to get as much um, return on your, your human capital assets as well as your uh, you know, tangible assets as well. So if that's fallen, there's a need for an in function or a focus inside the company to help drive increased productivity uh, and also to help human beings cope with that change. And that, that's an important distinction. So the title of this webinar was, okay, doing more with less. And, um, you know, as, as I got into this uh, question here or this setup, that I've just outlined for you here, you may be thinking, okay, maybe I'm on the wrong webinar. <laughs> um, but really, there are different ways to look at this challenge of doing more with less. One, uh, some uh, people in the learning function, they will look at this do more with less challenge as elevating the value contribution of the learning function to impact the business more without increasing headcount or cost of, of learning. That's one way to, to tackle uh, or, or to think about do more with less. A second way to think about it is, well, how do I, you know, in, in process or, or handle more inbound requests? And more importantly, how do I find the right type of inbound requests? And I want to do more with less that way. <clears throat> the third way that, that I'm seeing, you know, this kind of uh, do more with less approach is, well, we, we, have, to, we have to do e-learning. We have to reach more people. Uh, we got to do more with less with the right technology. Uh, and we need, to, we need to make sure that learners are able to benefit from training. So we want to do more with less that way. Now, for this webinar here, and I, I wanted to do this on the front end, I'm going to be talking mostly about number one. It's the role of the function itself and, and really making sure that the function of learning uh, is able to do more with less at a kind of a macro level. Um, I know there might be some questions around, you know, at, at a specific, um, you know, task level of how do we reach more learners, and that will be on future webinars, et cetera. But I, I wanted to make sure that we were clear going into this uh, content that I'm taking a top-down perspective, and this is a strategic challenge, that the idea of doing more with less is something that learning leaders are, are really uh, re recognizing as important in today's uh, environment because it, 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 it's an imperative of the, the CEO that the, that the learning leaders that I talk to do more with less in their function. Okay. So that's how we'll be talking uh, today here on this call. So when you think about doing more with less in that view, uh, there's really a shift and, and several shifts that are happening. The first shift is, you know, you're getting probably a, a decrease in budget, and, but you're being asked to, to create more of an impact. And that's a shift from that I'm seeing a focus on, well, this is my budget allocation to, you know what, I have, I have the ability in the learning function to drive an impact. How do I work with others? and maybe tap into line of business budgets. So there's a shift going on there with do more with less. 
I'm also seeing another shift of uh, the desire by learning leaders to shift from taking orders, uh, in, you know, just in processing or taking inbound requests, and really trying to solve problems, uh, learner-centric problems in the business. So instead of um, being an order taker, uh, quote unquote, using air quotes, order taker, they're trying to become more consultative, and that's a shift, and that's where the, uh, they're focused on trying to do more with less. Another area that I see learning leaders uh, really focused on, and, and this one is picking up in, in the recent months uh, in our clients, it's the shift from focusing on deliverables and, and cranking out deliverables to, to providing more of an end-to-end -end business service to line of business executives. And that's a huge distinction. It's a huge difference between how you are perceived by the company. If you're perceived as the com by the company as a course creator or the people who, per who run the LMS, and are, are implementing uh, maybe executive training, that's different than the, the function that can help us with the product launch, as an example. And then finally, another shift that I'm seeing is a shift uh, to, you know, to, to focus on the function in, in itself and, and, and what the function is really trying to achieve. In, in many of the cross-functional initiatives that I talked about earlier, uh, what we're seeing is it's not just skills required uh, for, for workers to be successful. But there are other things that need to be considered for workers to be successful. And that's more of an enablement view of the world. Uh, and, and we're seeing a, a shift to more of an enablement perspective in many of our clients where they're taking not only maybe the content, training content, but also the, the skills themselves of, of, the, of the workers that they're trying to work with and taking content plus skills and then thinking about perhaps the tools that, that need to be used in the trenches and cobbling that together into a more holistic answer to a, a particular performance challenge. And that, that view is more of an enablement view as opposed to a, um, a training view of the world. So in those four uh, shifts that are happening, I would say that a, a way to think about it is uh, learning is, is definitely being seen of, as a verb as opposed to a noun. And by that I mean, um, in order to do more with less, you, you have to be active, and you also have to treat learning as a, as a verb, as something that continuously evolves and is continuously uh, improved, and also that's a, a competitive advantage to your organization, as opposed to learning as a function, uh, learning as an LMS, or learning as a course, uh, and, and or a deliverable. And I think that perspective is, is an important distinction of how I see learning leaders shifting uh, to add more value to the business. The ones that are thinking about, well, I have capabilities inside the learning function or I have relationships inside my organization. How do I weave those capabilities and relationships together to impact performers? That's a learning as a verb type of view. As opposed to, I, I run the shared service function or I, I'm in charge of the LMS or I'm running a, a, uh, a training group. Uh, that's a, a noun view, view of the world. So I think an important aspect of doing more with less is really thinking deeply about this idea that learning is a verb. So I want to work through that with you, okay? Because uh, learning is a verb is an important um, perspective that helps you simplify the world around you. Okay, so let's take a look at that. If you think and, and uh, take a step back and say, okay, our business is changing and we're moving from a current state to a future state. There's a lot of... Um, you know, components required to, to achieve that future state, whether it's the organizational strategy, the people involved, the, the skills involved of those people, uh, perhaps the uh, organizational uh, uh, teaming and organizational design aspects themselves, or even just the technology that's implemented. There are a lot of things that need to shift and change. And so this idea of a, a new business strategy uh, really drives to the idea we have to have new execution. If we're driving new business strategies and, 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 and that require new execution, what many people have to do in their role is they have to think differently about their role. And thinking differently about their role means literally understanding the role of uh, sales has evolved. And then they have to act differently. And, and, and acting differently, that means because of the role of sales has evolved, as an example, I have to add value differently or I have to communicate differently to my clients because uh, the role of selling has shifted. And then finally, they have to make a different kind of impact. For salespeople, in that sales example, it means selling to executives, as an example. And so they have to make a different kind of impact. 
So I'm going to use this construct here in this uh, webinar to think about learning as a verb, how do we shift to the future state, and how do we do more with less. And, and I will submit to you that it's important to think differently, act differently, and then make a different kind of impact uh, in your role. And this is an important aspect for, for leaders across the learning function, um, no matter where they sit, because uh, most organizations uh, have, have an understanding of the role that learning can play in, in driving competitive advantage. Uh, and this uh, view helps position the learning function as an important asset inside the company. So let's talk about first this idea of thinking differently. When you think about this, um, I already talked to you about the, uh, the idea of the cross-functional work happening. Okay, so the world of work has changed. We have to be more cross-functional. Now, what that usually translates to is an awareness across the organization that we have to work differently because our customers are demanding more. In other words, we have shifting customer demands. We have different market segments. We have different demands placed on us, so therefore we, we need to work in, in team differently to bring that new product to market or to um, market ourselves differently, et cetera. Okay, so customers are demanding more. Now that has a trickle effect because uh, because our customers are demanding more, those salespeople over there in the sales function, they need to sell differently. So sales groups are important here to factor in. And so a lot of organizations are spending time with their sales teams to help them fail, sell differently. And then there's a re recognition because customers are demanding more that marketing has to think differently as well. And you know what? We need better marketing. We need different marketing approaches, marketing tactics. We've got to plug into different types of technologies, whatever. It, th this is going to create a need for marketing to evolve because customers are demanding more. And then the product groups, R&D groups, have to also uh, change. They've got to be more innovative. You know, the I iPhone came out. Everybody has on-demand everything. So how are we going to respond in our business? Or perhaps uh, the competitor down the street is offering new solutions in, in an in a easier, faster, or cheaper way. How are we going to respond, R&D groups? And then finally, there's this need or awareness that I've seen in the last year and a half to two years that because of this you know, the, the evolution inside the company and because of the nature of work has changed, we've got to have better leaders. We have a leadership void, so we need to have better leaders too. Now, when I ask this question or um, you know, think about this as I ask it, but would you agree that sales groups, marketing groups, R&D groups and, and maybe even the leadership team need to change in this cross-functional view. In other words, do they need to evolve how they're thinking in order to add more value to customers or to, to work together differently? When I ask this in, in audiences, I always get a yes. In the learning audience, yes, absolutely, sales groups, marketing groups, R&D groups, and even the leadership all need to change. Well, that's, that's good, and I, I, and I would agree with you. So let me ask you something. What, what about what about you? What about the learning function? Does the learning function need to change as well? Now, what we're finding is, and the reason why I'm asking this is, that in this view of doing more with less, we're finding two uh, primary mindsets or archetypes that are evolving. One is an efficiency-driven archetype. I'm going to do more with less by getting more throughput through the learning function. And then there's a different archetype, a performance-driven archetype, it says, I'm going to do more with less by leveraging the capabilities of my function to help impact roles differently. And I'm going to create a different type of, of uh, value inside my company and do more with less that way. So there is an efficiency-driven view of doing more with less versus a performance-driven view of, uh, of doing more with less. And I would ask you, which one's more valuable to your executive? Which one's more value to you, has more value to your CEO? As they're looking to change their world and their function and their uh, company that you're a part of, what type of learning leader or what type of learning function is most valuable to them? And when I ask this question, it's usually the performance-driven column that stands out to people. And, and But to get there, you've got to think differently. Just like sales, marketing, product groups, and even the leadership team have to think differently about their role, so does the learning function. And this is an important, important perspective because uh, thinking through uh, these new challenges that exist uh, is, is a key uh, requirement to, to add doing more with less. 
Okay, so let's take a look at thinking differently. One of the simple litmus tests that I use is uh, what's your charter? What is your charter in your function? And how would you communicate that to executives? And I see two primary views of the charter. One is a bottom-up view of the charter. We run courses. We uh, keep content fresh. We make sure we have enough coverage for, for facilitation. We make sure we have um, uh, enough uh, new content for new products that are being launched, whatever. And then I see a top-down view of a charter, such as my job is to make sure that I help uh, drive the human capital strategy forward by enabling critical roles to be successful. That's a different charter. So in many organizations, the learning function has not established what I would consider a top-down uh, charter. They're, they've established a bottoms-up charter, and they're perceived that way because of it. Because of the way they act, uh, they're perceived that way. But then uh, when it comes time to, to acting differently, there's, there's a lot of pushback inside the company. And that pushback can be uh, really manifested in a lot of different ways, but it really comes down to the charter that you have inside your company. So one litmus test is what's your charter, and, and can you think differently about the charter that you have? And how would you recast your charter in this learning is a verb, not a noun, in order to do more with less? And I'm hoping that today's webinar will help uh, kind of uh, shape that out a little bit, and I'm going to give us some thinking here to, um, to bring this to life, okay? So if in this view here on this picture, I've got three concentric circles, kind of like a chain. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to walk through each because each one is an important perspective, and it also helps us think differently so we can act differently. The first thing is, is the fundamental question of what do we need to do in our, in our learning function? What do we need to do? And, and, and to answer that, the, 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 the critical chain here is, the critical link in this chain, is to link the business strategy to the learning strategy. So we're going to we're going to talk about that. The second thing, the second question that you should ask is, well, how do you need to think about it? So what do we need to do is different than what do we need to th to do to think about it. And, and the second link of this chain is to link the learning strategy to specific workloads. That's going to help us think about how we engage with the business. And then the third piece here of this chain is what impact do we need to drive? And that's where we're going to link. Uh, learning workloads to, to execution. So this is a tool or this is a way to think about doing more with less. What do we need to do? We're going to focus on linking business strategy to learning strategy. How do we need to think about what we're doing by linking the learning strategies to specific workloads? And then what impact do we need to drive in order to, uh, to do more with less? And that's going to be linking workloads to execution. Now an important distinction here is, is before we walk into this is to think about this, this question, and, and I'm going to put this up here, and, and, and you know, I want you to think about this and take a step back, and, and this is important because the way you answer this question will help you really inform how you process the rest of this information. And the question I would ask you is, in your role, are you an architect or a plumber? And, and, and this question might, might be worth noodling on for the next two weeks, but the, the point of this question is, the idea of architecting these three concentric circles or architecting these components of the chain is different than building the plumbing to pull them off. And in today's world, doing more with less, we're finding that more architecting time is needed to think through the business strategy and linking business strategy to execution than, than really spending time on a best-in-class plumbing. In other words, most executives believe the plumbing's okay, but the architecture is not. And so um, this is an important question that you would need to ask yourself. Are you an architect or a plumber? Are you thinking about this as an architect or a plumber? What does a plumber do? Well, they provide the plumbing inside of a house. What does an architect do? They create the blueprint for the house and make sure that it's uh, usable and feasible. And that's, that's an important distinction. Okay, so let's talk about linking the business strategy to the learning strategy. I'm going to plot out two axes here, okay? And again, this is, these are components here, uh, A, B, and C, these, these, these links to this chain are going to help us do more with less. Okay, so first off is if you look at the, the needs of a learner on the horizontal axis and ask yourself, are learning needs evolving or are they static? That's the horizontal axis. The vertical axis is, well, what's the catalyst for learning? Why are we doing learning in the first place if we're going to do this thing called learning on our people? 
why, why are we doing it? Is it to transfer knowledge or is it to drive behavior change? And when you plot this out, you know, four quadrants emerge. And we can look at this and say, okay, what's our, what's our learning strategy then? And, and, and are we going to treat the whole company the same? Because interestingly enough, what I'm finding in our clients is they have to have a uh, portfolio of learning strategies based on the roles that they're serving. For an example, if you think about the role of salespeople, their learner needs are constantly evolving because their customers are evolving too. And most CEOs would, would recommend that their sales team change their behavior. So sales teams are going to be top right quadrant. So how do you uh, think about the learning strategy there? Versus maybe somebody in accounting who um, only goes through a, a change when there's a, a new regulation, they're a little bit more static in what they need to know. And perhaps uh, what, what they need to know is already taught in many different schools, so the knowledge transfer component really is about what your company does. So maybe if somebody in accounting or finance is in the bottom left. These are just kind of kind of examples to breathe some life into it. But you can plot out then your learning strategy. If you're going to have a siloed view where you um, take a, a function perhaps and, and, and develop a learning strategy versus more of an adaptive learning strategy where you work backwards from, from people in roles and, and define uh, what they need from a learning perspective. A distributed uh, uh, model would be driving that behavior change, maybe uh, leaning on the regions a little bit more. And then the segmented view is tapping into more of informal networks, et cetera, based on uh, communities of practice, things like that. Okay, so that's, that's one tool. Okay, so that's, that's one way to think about it is how are you thinking about your function and what type of function are you trying to build? The second question here then is, well, how do we link, link learning strategy to specific workloads? And this is an important question because oftentimes we don't think about the portfolio of workloads that we're asked to support inside the, of the uh, organization. So I've got two axes here, and we're going to build a, uh, another a tool. But if you ask yourself what's the relevance to the business of what we're working on versus the capacity that we have to pull it off, that's the vertical axis. What's the business relevance to the organization versus our ability to actually execute it? And then if we ask ourselves, well, what things are more of a high-touch service level to our internal clients? You know, uh, what, what things are we working on that uh, require more hand-holding uh, that would plot uh, on this uh, horizontal axis? And you could kind of plot out some different uh, initiatives inside of the function that you, you know, depending on the scope of your, of your role. If, you're, if you have a more of an HR talent uh, bent um, and, and learning bent, so I'm, I'm taking a, a very big broad view of, of quote-unquote learning, I'm going to incorporate HR, a little bit of HR, talent, and, and uh, learning, traditional learning, all into these workloads so we can uh, blow this out a little bit. Uh, if, you, if you think about it, you can plot out things that happen inside the, the learning function on these axes. And you can see that in, in some areas that have more business relevance that require higher touch service level, that, that requires more of a, uh, of a, a two hands on the wheel uh, architecting approach where you're thinking through more of these components versus uh, maybe down on the left side, bottom left quadrant, uh, you can maybe uh, do business as usual or maybe even outsource it easier. So there's, there's a different footprint based on what you're working on uh, based on uh, the, the, the actual relevance to the business and how much uh, hand-holding you need to do in your function. And some, some organizations that I'm talking to want to shift this view. They're trying to shift to become more business relevant and, and become more of a consultant, and they're trying to move into that top right quadrant. And that means they have to stop doing so much in the bottom left. You know, uh, because they have limited re resources, uh, they got to apply their resources differently. So this, this type of view leads into a whole slew of questions around, well, how are we going to pull this off? Where do we put our emphasis? What are our priorities, et cetera? So this is just a tool to help think that through. The second link of that chain was to link the business strategy to the, act, the workloads to actual execution. So when you look at the execution of the organization um, and, and how you are executing these uh, initiatives within your organization, um, the, the focus here becomes we have these workloads from B, and now we need to execute differently. And how are we going to execute? So we're going we're gonna to plot on the horizontal axis uh, an integrated view of execution versus a fragmented view. An ongoing impact view versus a deliverable view will plot on the, 
the business strategy axis, which is the vertical axis. And this gets to, okay, we have to execute in, a, in an integrated or holistic way versus a fragmented way where we can do a one-off. Or we can put out deliverables and or um, activities in a, in a uh, specific uh, time and, and event. Or we have to create some sort of ongoing impact. And when we plot that out onto the two by twos, what I'm finding is, is there's an event-driven cadence uh, in, of execution inside of companies versus a trend-driven execution uh, element inside of companies, maybe responding to mobile or responding to um, you know, new trends in uh, delivery. Then there's a performance-driven view where we're trying to create ongoing impact in an integrated way versus a solution-driven view, which is trying to create some sort of maybe a, a, new, a new hire training program. Uh, in an end-to-end -end way. So um, this view becomes, okay, how do we execute differently? And when we think through these, these uh, components of, um, you know, defining, linking the business strategy and the, to the learning strategy, learning the, taking the learning strategy and link, linking it to workloads, and then taking the workloads and then executing differently, which is uh, this slide, um, you know, taking the workloads and executing differently, then we find that there's a sweet spot of where we should be applying our, our resources, our time, and our efforts, and while keeping the lights on in the other area of the learning business. So in other words, you end up with a two-pronged strategy of what do we need to do to keep the lights on versus where should we apply our resources and, and really make some impact for the business so we can do more with less. And uh, this type of uh, thinking helps uh, learning leaders uh, define the, the future state of their, their organization, okay? So if you're trying to drive business outcomes uh, versus um, just trying to get the job done, that's how you can be changing your perspective internally, okay? So this is an example of, of, of some tools that, that we've used with clients to help them think differently in their work. Now let's talk about how we're seeing organizations act differently, uh, learning functions act differently inside their organization. For many, the acting differently comes down to a, a simple analogy of, of, a, of a game or of a solving a problem. For, for many learning leaders, the idea that um, they have to help people in critical roles shift their behavior and execute differently, that, that's not something that can just be, you know, you can't just wave your magic wand, so to speak, and get it done. And, and, and learning leaders are trying to figure out how to execute in a way that's more uh, iterative and evolves over time. And, and they're saying things like, "Well, we got to figure this out. We're, we can't just we can't just get this into a, a course. So how do we how do we uh, figure this out? And how do we really uh, configure ourselves to be successful?" So if you take the learning function and you strip out the org chart. So just take away the organizational structure of your company. You guys in the learning function have expertise. And, you, and we can just plot that out here. So we've got expertise. We're just going to lay it out like cards on a table. This is an expertise that I traditionally see inside of learning, learning functions. And then if you take the – and disregard the org chart again and ask yourself, well, what are we doing? What, what are we – uh, adding, where are we adding value and how are we adding value? And what cap capabilities are we leveraging to add value to our company? And it might look like something like this, where you're, you're communicating internally or you're creating content or you're packaging uh, content, et cetera. So these are capabilities that you have. And, you know, that's, that view of the world is pretty far and removed from the CEO's view of the world. In other words, it's lost on them. They, they, they un expertise and the capabilities that you have don't necessarily make it easy for CEOs to understand your value contribution. You have to configure yourself differently because the CEO is trying to shift the business strategy or perhaps trying to redefine their go-to-market or change their product set or clarify their core competency or acquire new capabilities. What are you going to do to help them do that? How do you configure yourself? And that, that gap is pretty big. It, it's a... In some companies, uh, it's, a, it's a chasm. And, and I think one of the key here is really to think about, well, who's between you and the CEO? And, and what are the roles of these individuals that are in these, for this example, these VP jobs? Because if you think about it, 
VPs of sales have a different charter than the VP of marketing or the VP of HR or the VP of manufacturing. So how are you going to help all of these individuals, these leaders inside of, the, of your organization uh, achieve their charter and achieve their goals? And how you, by doing that, are you going to add value to the CEO? Okay, so let's take this here and say, okay, let's, let's, let's try to tackle this question. We're gonna, we have to do more with less. You know, Brian, you just outlined we've got all these roles we have to serve. That seems like doing more, 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 more. <laughs> uh, how, how, are we, how are we going to pull that off? Well, oftentimes in the view of, of this uh, landscape, what I see is uh, an attempt by learning leaders to say, well, these are our capabilities. These are the things we do. And we're going to simplify the world around us and just lead with this. We're going to explain ourselves by the capabilities we, we deliver and the VPs out there in this case, they'll come to us when they want it. That's one, one way. The other way is to say, well, you know what, we, we have specific standards that we roll out and processes that we manage. And when you want to participate in, in our standards or in our processes, uh, we'll let you take part and that's how we'll add value to you. Um, the next piece is um, if you take the, the technology that you support, uh, perhaps you, you've taken a more of a technology focus and saying, these are the technologies that we run. Uh, this is what you can, what we'll do for you, and, and how we'll help you in your role. Now, for most uh, VPs at this level and at the CEO level, y y it, the success here really depends on the blend of all these things. It, it's a little bit of learning capability, a little bit of processes and standards, and a little bit of technology. So, so how do you how do you build something that's going to impact them uh, individually? but yet let you have a consistent core to uh, perhaps stretch into uh, different lines of business while at the same time maintaining your, your, your core learning function that you can uh, really drive cost out of. And that's where we're seeing uh, an, an emerging of what we're calling the adaptive learning services portfolio, where there's a, a yellow layer, a middleware layer of, of learning services that are provided to these VPs that the services themselves are configured in such a way that you can get leverage, but they're uniquely tailored to support people in key roles. So we're seeing learning executives shift from I run technology, I run standards and processes, I run learning, to these are the services I provide you, VP of sales. And this is the VP of sales service I'm starting with, this is the VP of innovation, R&D that I'm starting with, et cetera. And uh, building a services portfolio that they can then um, ask people to participate in. And that's where we're seeing a shift in, in, in that, um, that uh, world. When that happens, what, what we're seeing here under this idea of acting differently is that the learning and the development leaders have to, to operate differently. And they're really, really rethinking, rethinking their operating model. And a, an operating model is, is a construct that really is you know, build, it, it builds a bridge between the organization's business strategy and, and your resources. It's, it's not a org chart structure as much as it is how do you engage or how do you team uh, against that uh, specific role or specific function you're trying to, to support. Um, and so if you think about configuring yourself, how do you team? How do you manage resources? How do you decide who gets to do what? Uh, how do you bring in the right processes and technology? And then how do you manage your own skills and competencies of your team to build that more adaptive learning services portfolio? What we're finding is the L&D leaders have to really rethink the capabilities of their own team in order to uh, add a, a different, uh, I guess, feel to the organization where they, they engage differently because of the way that their, their operating model is set up so they, they can position themselves as more of a service provider instead of a, a, a deliverable creator. And that's the, the shift here that I think is important is the idea that we're shifting from uh, a stance of, of an organizing ourselves by the deliverables that, that, that we get produced to how do we configure ourselves, how do we operate to provide a, a business service to executives. And that's completely different. So um, it's still the same capabilities, it's still the same uh, expertise, but it's configured in a more consumable way uh, that allows you to get more leverage. So when that happens, 
it, it, it's a, a implication at the executive level, especially in, in, in L&D, to think about, okay, do we, do we have the right people to do this? Do we have the, the, the roles defined? Do we need more consultative type folks involved? Do we, do we have the right skills to, um, to add value to sales, for example, which we've lar largely ignored over the years? Um, where, how are we going to shift our priorities? Do we, do, we, do we know what we need to do going forward? How are we going to keep the lights on? Um, how do we improve the teaming on our own team, of our own L&D team? And, and what workflows are we going to go impact as a company, as a, as, a, as a function within our company? What workflows are we going to try to drive to? So um, th this is an important uh, little scorecard. This actually came from one of our clients who's really rethinking um, the function of, of learning to become more what I would consider outside in uh, and more adaptive. And building that adaptive learning function uh, requires uh, capabilities that you can use over and over again, but a need to tailor to meet the, the specific unique needs of, of uh, people in their role. Okay, so when that happens, uh, it seems like with our clients, new roles and work are emerging inside the learning function. The, the, and, and this is a, a chart here that I'm trying to, to use to illuminate how, how things are evolving. What I'm seeing is that uh, learning functions are spending more uh, time developing what I consider visioning capability. The, the idea that um, they have to cast a vision with the line of business, as an example, and, and really position themselves as a, a competitive advantage inside the company. That's what I mean by visioning. And they're spending more and more time on that, and that's a, it's a huge uh, link that's often missing in the operating model is the idea to add thought leadership or provide a point of view, to be an architect uh, at, at the C-level, et cetera. Then I'm seeing uh, a focus on delivering. Uh, in other words, um, rethinking how, how they deliver value to the business, not just uh, taking a uh, project-centric view, but shifting to more of a services view. And then how do they set expectations with um, the business? Now, one, one learning leader said, He's appointed his own L&D salesperson. Uh, this person is the chief uh, seller, <laughs> the seller of learning and development services to the line of business. And, and he himself spends a lot of time building a bridge over to minds of business and setting expectations around how he can help. And so this is a, um, a, uh, an, an emerging uh, component here. So I plotted this chart out. And, and, you know, working on it with clients, and, and it was interesting because they, it's almost like they have the, the, the delivering uh, component, like there's a sweet spot around deliver, uh, deliver, deliver, deliver. Uh, there's a weak spot around expectation setting and visioning. And it's interesting because a lot of times I hear, well, we don't have a seat at the table, and, and uh, you know, we're perceived as order takers. But that's how things have been set up. Uh, and that's what the, the focus has been on. Deliver, deliver, deliver. Give us something to deliver against. Give us an order. We'll deliver it. We Give us a, a, a crisis and we'll respond. You know, we can deliver. We can deliver. Deliver, deliver, deliver. That's, that's a different feel from, hey, what's your problem? Or I was doing some analysis and I think you might have an issue with this sales force, et cetera. So um, the idea of, of a vision, selling the vision internally, that's a capability that we're seeing, uh, and, and also setting expectations. And this is, this is a do more with less, uh, you know, uh, dilemma because in order to do more with less, you have to get out of the, almost the, um, the, the churn of the learning function. And, and to do that, what we're seeing is learning leaders are trying to move to more of a line of business focus, trying to reach across the aisle and find pilot projects where they can work in a new way while at the same time delivering in the old way. And it is, there's a two-prong attack of trying to shift to become more of a service provider, while at the same time, uh, you know, keeping the lights on. And, and the, the leverage comes from being able to deliver a different type of service over time and, and, and using the, the core delivery engine to do that. Okay, so that um, is the first two, how do we think differently and act differently. And now what we'll do is I'll show you some examples of, of impact differently and what this sets up. 
So in this idea I, I just shared a while ago was this idea of a new charter. And it really is simple, to, if you keep it simple, to go, okay, um, how do we position ourselves to, you know, um, from, from the left side, hey, learning function, when can my request be fulfilled? I, I, need, I need this. To, hey, learning function, uh, we're about to go into a new area. What do you think? Uh, what, do you, what do you think we should be doing to help our people? So that's, that's kind of what we're shooting for. But the challenge is that is, is we have to adapt. And, and I think there's a, there's a huge um, catalyst for this. And, 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 and in my role, I have a lot, a lot of different uh, inputs. And I work across a lot of different industries and a lot of different roles. And um, in early January, uh, February time frame, I got a phone call from a learning executive. And um, I'm going to share with you what, what she shared with me. And then at the same time, um, because I do a lot of research on companies, uh, a, a, an organization was shifting its, its business model to drive different kinds of impact. And I'm going to share, share that with you too. So I'm going to share a learning perspective uh, here on the left and a, and a, and a uh, sales perspective or a CEO perspective on the right. And so from the sales perspective, um, I'm going to use Steve Bennett from Symantec. And this is a, from a publicly available earnings call. He said, on our go-to-market strategy, what I would say simply is we had talented people everywhere in the world working really hard, but that our system doesn't work. Or probably better said, we don't have a system. Our processes, our technology, the tools we have, our knowledge management, our sales force is not empowered and freed up to sell. So that's a sales perspective. Now, the interesting thing about it, if you go and read through the subsequent phone calls and the earnings calls, he's uh, basically shifted the focus to be more horizontal inside of his company. But look at what he's pointing at as not helpful. It's stuff that we oftentimes uh, do in learning, knowledge management, tools, technology, processes. Uh, we don't have a system. And the question about that is, well, what, what system is he talking about? In this case, he's talking about the system behind growth, the system behind salespeople, the system behind sales conversation. And that's what he's talking about. And so we've got an architecture where we've maybe orchestrated a lot of moving parts, but the design point's wrong. And, and that's caused him consternation in his role, and he's actually gone through a lot of moves internally. Now, at the same time that that was happening, you've got the CEO of Symantec saying things like that. I get a phone call from the learning leader who says this. We just had $16 million cut out of our centralized learning budget and shifted over to the sales organization, and that includes headcount. Now, this is a technology company, again, that, that you would know. It's not Symantec, but you would, you would definitely know these guys. And, and the, the, this is not a good phone call to have. I, I, I was not, not happy with this. It was a sad day <laughs> because uh, the reason that, that this person gave when, when she called was, uh, why this happened. I asked her, I said, why did that happen? She said, because the CEO of our company believes that the sales leadership can run the learning function better for their people than we can. And then, then I said, well, what are you guys left with? And it's basically learning is a noun. That's my interpretation is what she said, uh, of, of, of what she said. She said, we run uh, the shared services, we run facilitators, uh, we do some leadership development, and we run the LMS. Um, so uh, she uh, was not able to, in, in her function, uh, change her perspective, th change how she thinks, change how she acted, and this is the impact that she got uh, because of that. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I'm, this is just reality. It's recent. It's in the last year. Uh, companies have to drive more productivity. Uh, they have to drive more productivity from their people. They have to be more competitive, and people uh, have to change their behavior, and the learning function should be helping with that. And in this case, they didn't cut the whole thing. They shifted it to somewhere else. So clearly the learning uh, capabilities and expertise are important, but they just weren't necessarily making an impact. And so uh, they moved it to sales. So when I talk about shifting your charter, here's an example of, of what uh, a client built and what they shopped around internally inside their organization. This is the action that they took. They said that they wanted to increase productivity of workers across the enterprise. That's a pretty aspirational uh, objective. But if you think about it, I shared with you how return on assets have declined. 
So you're, you're within your right to go after that. The second thing that they said in their charter was they want to help the executive team bridge the gap between strategy and execution by helping workers align work accomplishments to their business strategy. And that's an important uh, aspect of, of the work that needs to happen needs to support the business strategy. And again, that's a, a role and within scope of the learning function. They also want to use uh, decrease what, what I call organizational drag. Organizational drag is uh, the, the, the components working together inside of a company, and this comes from uh, Forrester Research again. But the, the idea that the, the idea that uh, functions need to work together, uh, we need to decrease the organizational drag to, inside of our company and get people to work together differently, with the purpose of accelerating business initiatives to overcome barriers to performance. Now, this company that adopted this component of, of this charter had a lot of complexity uh, in the sales force that they needed to overcome, and they really needed to uh, simplify behind salespeople. And that's, that's within, again, the scope and role and purview of the learning function. That's within your right to go after it, I would say. And the fourth is worker, helping workers increase their value contribution by learning the new skills and acquiring the right expertise. And I think... That's obviously a, a learning uh, function role, um, <clears throat> but if you think about how work has changed, uh, do we have a rear view mirror uh, view of the world, and are we enabling to a uh, you know ten year ago definition of success, or are we being forward leaning in our view of what workers need? So this is an example of action. It, it's establishing over time a new charter to engage the business differently, and that requires. Um, you know, a, a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of architecting, a lot of um, understanding of, of the workloads and the, the uh, you know, different types of assets that you have available to you. And, and I think, you know, it's important to really um, understand that the, the function of learning is a valuable one. And uh, the CEOs need you to do more with less in this way uh, because, uh, you know, nobody else is going to do it. And so to help with that, I put some... You know, there's five things here I think that I want to really leave you with to, to help you seize the, seize the momentum and really move into what I consider a huge, huge gap that exists in many companies, and it's the gap between learning and sales or the gap between learning and marketing or the gap between learning and, and product, et cetera. And moving more comfortably into the line of business is really think about your perspective. What, what is your perspective that you're bringing are you thinking holistically? Are you really tackling the reality in the trenches? Or is your perspective that learning is a noun? Or are you chasing after trends? And that's your perspective. Uh, the second one is make a plan. Uh, I think it's important. You know, we're, we're kind of coming down at the end of a calendar year with some businesses on the phone. That's the end of your planning cycle. Or that perhaps you just got new money uh, that you're going to be able to use in January. I think, um, you know, Think about how you can carve off um, a, a way to, to operate differently and test it out in order to get some traction. You know, start with low-hanging fruit and, and find an easy way to, to start building more of an end-to-end -end view. Uh, and then third piece is think about building services, not deliverables. Um, I know we're in a deliverable world. I, I get that. But if you think about what your executives need from you, they need help with things like, uh, onboarding new hires more successfully or bringing new products to market or perhaps in merger and acquisition, uh, you know, integration. That's the, that's the help they need. Um, and, and I think we often end up managing a course catalog instead of uh, really partnering with the executive around their business initiative. The, third, the fourth one is you have to take an iterative approach with this. You can't just... Uh, you know, roll it out uh, across your whole organization. I think you have to start small and iterate towards that and, um, you know, start acting uh, in, a, in a different way. You know, remember I talked about thinking differently, acting differently, and impacting differently. It, it starts with thinking and acting differently. And I think uh, to, to, to start iterating over time is, is to just take a, a, a small bite of the apple and start uh, iterating uh, in a continuous improvement way. And then finally, I would say that you've got to take more of an outside-in view. Um, if you think about it, many of the uh, initiatives that I talked about on this phone are within the, the purview of the learning function, but for some reason 
we don't necessarily go there all the time. Uh, maybe we're not perceived that way, or perhaps we haven't necessarily established an approach to go do it. But um, if, you, if you work backwards from your organization's customers, the customers that your organization sells to, or the customers or the stakeholders that your organization supports, and, and work backwards from that, uh, the more you understand who your customers or stakeholders are, the easier it is for you to, to drive towards this do more with less reality. Okay? So um, the, finally, I, what I wanted to do is give you um, this idea of architecting versus uh, plumbing. I think if you really focus on different skills, perhaps, uh, or, or assembling a team that can operate in this whole stack, you know, who on your team is, is the architecting type of folks? Who on your team are good general contractors? Who on your team are good skilled laborers? And then who on your team can help maintain what you build? What, what I see is an overemphasis uh, on the, the bottom two. And, and right now in today's world, uh, there's a huge shift, a huge push by uh, learning executives to, on the top two, uh, uh, getting the answer right. Uh, and I think uh, that's more valuable position yourself at. So um, a special offer for, for you that have uh, attended this webinar, what I'd like to do is offer a free, free time with me if you'd like to chat some more about this. Uh, I'm giving away a 30-minute consultation around these, these ideas. Um, you can email Karen Merrill, uh, who can set that, that up with you to talk about doing more with less, perhaps shifting the operating model of, of the, uh, uh, the learning function. Uh, driving more value uh, in the line of business, or perhaps even the skills required uh, of the, of the uh, people on your team. Um, there's my contact information as well. I'm happy to connect with you on LinkedIn, um, also on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, feel free to, to reach out for me that way. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, spend a couple minutes here on questions. Uh, so, Kristen, if you could um, see what's in the chat box for me. I'll keep this uh, contact information up here uh, as well. So let's see what questions we have. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we did have one come through. During this presentation, you specify learning as a function. Can you share your perspective of how learning is distinguished from development? Yeah, I think um, when I look at learning, I, I, I tend to view it as kind of capital L learning. Um, Learning as a function to me is a, it's a typically found as a, an HR function where human resources are, need to be developed over time. So if you think of a development slash facilitation slash uh, learning technology uh, slash a little bit of talent um, slash um, the uh, uh, instructional design or, or creation and then the, the delivery of, of training, that's what I'd basically mean by the learning function. It's a, uh, learning services, learning administration, a little bit of uh, talent management to make sure that people are, are getting equipped with what they need to be successful, uh, and that's how I would view it. Now, from a development perspective, there's a, you know, developing people, or you can say development, and sometimes that function, the learning, learning organizations call the development team, the content team, uh, you know, developing content. So that's how I would make that distinction. I'm, I'm coming at this from uh, the top down. Development would be part of my definition of learning. Okay, we have one more. What type of skills are often required to make the shift to this new way of working? Good question. So, um, well, there, there are a lot of uh, different capabilities. Um, depends on the organization and, and what uh, team exists within the organization. Uh, in, in one example, I can give you uh, the, the learning leaders uh, took stock of the different types of folks on the team, and they came up with an aspirational slate. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. I can probably show you because um, I have it in a different presentation. Um, but they, they came up with a different slate of what, what they would need for um, roles for the people on their team. And here it is right here. I'll put it up. But um, when, they, when they talked about um, building uh, their, their new, new way of working, if you think about it, uh, the good enough capabilities at the bottom, they, they definitely needed to build training that inspires and, and make sure that they, people retain what was learned and 
to use technology and knowledge management. But the, so those those capabilities and skills of, of the individuals on the team were were kind of good enough in their view. But what the, where they had a blind spot or where they needed to have different capabilities were, were in the blue area here. They were looking for people who could consult with the business, um, looking for people who can build dynamic content that could actually uh, be used by salespeople and perhaps uh, be, you know, build case studies or um, you know, simulations that salespeople could use in this example. Um, they also thought about, well, how do we uh, you know, manage our own function differently? Do we have uh, financial acumen we need to um, – you know, drive costs out of the learning function. So they were looking at their their, their own, um, you know, executive with an executive lens. Their own look, looking at their own function, and they re recognized that they probably needed to develop more uh, financial or, or accounting acumen. So those were some skills that they they looked to develop. Okay, um, doesn't look like we have any more questions at this time, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you everyone for attending, and I am going to share Karen Merrill's information one more time on the screen um, in case, because I had a question asking for the contact information again. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Brian, and have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody.